In terms of the outputs of this uh, conference, uh, we will uh, be generating a, um, a paper, um, but uh, I think also we want to be able to, if there are uh, things that uh, people want to work on, you know, whether it be as working groups or whatever, after many of these meetings we've established groups to work on specific projects and so uh, it, uh, we will just kind of see how those things develop over time. So it'll be a little bit more free fall, free for all, not free fall I hope, <laughs> uh, <coughs> still waiting for the coffee to take effect. Yeah. Um, and so uh, the other thing we're going to do is that uh, Blackford and I are going to try and tag team uh, this uh, this morning, and, and so we'll see if this uh, doesn't turn into an episode of whose line is it anyway. But uh, uh, at any rate, hopefully that'll be uh, uh, worthwhile. So Maybe, I'm uh, here we just thank thanks, Mark. And uh, you know, any allusions or jokes about Laurel and Hardy or you know Simon and Garfunkel or anybody, <laughs> uh, please keep those to yourself. Frick and frack, uh, that'd be good. You know, I thought the conversation yesterday was incredibly rich, and uh, I appreciate everyone's time and interest and enthusiasm and uh, insight being offered so freely. You know, as someone who's been working in CDS for more than 20 years, um, it strikes me that actually when we consider genomic CDS, we may need to address many of the complexities and issues that have been inadequately addressed in CDS to date. So in a way, I see a green field, a clean slate opportunity. We may not get to solve everything, uh, but hopefully we'll have a picture of what the entire solution space you know, would look like uh, for genomic CDS. And I think that may then back, back inform or, or fill in some of the deficiencies we have with the current state of the art in CDS, which is typically you know, the cross-sectional one well, encounter-based uh, alerts and reminders and all the result in fatigue and uh, related issues. So we're going to summarize the discussions uh, in brief form. And I think we have enough time to invite you to ask questions as we go. Uh, Mark and I will split this up. And if there are key themes or key points that are missed or overlooked, please uh, do jump in, and we'll aim to capture those as well. Yeah, so Jackie, uh, uh, I don't think we actually, so Rita or Teji, could you send a copy of the slide deck to Jackie? And so since we can't make notes on the slides, then we can, uh, uh, we can have Jackie do that uh, if we do want to make some adjustments. Thank you. Thank you. So Mark will be playing the Phil Donahue roving in the audience and uh, asking you what's up, uh, and I'll, I'll stick here. So uh, you recall the objectives. We'll come back to this at the end when we try to summarize. But we wanted to compare the current state with the ideal state. Uh, identify and engage U.S. In, in, in the international health IT communities that might be uh, interested in this, and finally get to this notion of the prioritized research agenda. I think number two um, has largely been accomplished. We had a, a, a you know a, a variety of different uh, initiatives described, and potential engagement across these initiatives would be very exciting. It seems, in fact, like there's sort of an opportunity uh, at hand, sort of. You know, I don't know what to call it exactly, but it is an opportunity at hand where many forces are, are, con, uh, are the confluence of many forces may actually force the issue around genomic CDS in ways that hasn't happened for other types of CDS uh, to date. But the NHGRI and NIH funded projects like eMERGE and CSER, IGNITE, of course, the work on and uh, newborn sequencing, ClinSeq, CPIC, uh, potential examples and initiatives to relate to. The IOM Action Initiative, I've heard just a little bit about uh, the ONC and AHRQ, CDS ongoing initiatives, VA, the CDSC, healthy decision, uh, 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 the work at the ONC to describe use case one, use case two for the CDS knowledge representation at the uh, ONC, the open info button, open CDS work, Ken Kawamoto and others have been leading. The smart fire, uh, that just sounds so attractive actually, smart fire. Um, but you know, I think we could get some marketing uh, mileage out of that, and maybe others as well. You recall this, the key questions, I won't belabor these. And in number one, Dan uh, just gave such a nice and eloquent, as usual, overview of what sort of are the key issues and what might an ideal state of genomic CDS look like. And Dan described the ideal GCDS for users as being current, repurposable knowledge to different settings, health literacy and numeracy sensitive, providing explanations and recommendations, 
and learning and adaptive, that it is a closed loop with an assessment function that returns impact and outcomes and process change data to the knowledge engineers or the CDS implementers so they can update knowledge and make it more uh, appropriate and fine-tuned. Equally importantly, uh, of course, is the notion of what healthcare organizations need today. And they, they need a system or a system of systems which allows us to improve quality and reliability, tracks the GCD, uh, GCDS events, and follows up whether followed or not, and continues to uh, allow continuous local and national learning. And interesting questions were raised about operations research and clinical research, but the notion that uh, GCDS may have to span that spectrum, uh, I think, is clear, and provide value to the healthcare organizations, which came up later in discussion in the ROI comments, as you recall. Building blocks, the notion of decision support packages, uh, knowledge packs is a word I've used to describe these before, but recognition logic for genotype and phenotype uh, in the EHR, the guidance, of course, for the clinician, the patient, or the family, recognition logic for the closed loop decision support, how do we take that outcome assessment of process change, quality change, cost impact, what have you, and feed it back to uh, update the knowledge uh, recognition logic and knowledge structures. We need authoring systems, of course. Ideally, these would be multi-author systems where collaboration could occur and consensus could be managed and uncertainty could be managed in the authoring environment. Uh, event monitors embedded within EHRs and PHRs to listen and look for those triggering events, which we had another rich discussion on. And then system-generated alerts at the teachable moment which may or may not be the same thing as the clinical decision moment, but both are related, and this logic uh, would be nice to be available to the clinician, whether he's perusing a record or actually seeing a patient. Automated tracking of outcomes and, and versus the user decisions, whether you abide by the guidance or not, is critically important to know and understand, and upload your experience to this notion of the CDS public library, the quid pro quo. If you download, you must donate, and you must share to uh, create this virtuous learning cycle in the learning community. Actually, it might be worth um, uh, stepping back to that uh, slide. And, and, you know, one of the things that we, we wanted to do as uh, one of the key objectives was to try and define um, uh, what is the ideal state. And I think that um, that is a little bit challenging to uh, try and envision. Uh, but I think this is at least an attempt to at, the, at least say what, what, are, what would the key elements of the ideal state look like. And so it might be worth, you know, pausing here for a little bit of discussion to say, are there things that are represented on this list that, you know, uh, either are not represented uh, as you would envision them in an ideal state or um, that perhaps shouldn't be here, but more importantly, are there uh, aspects of what we think would be ideal state uh, that we haven't represented uh, that. So, you know, take a, a couple of minutes to, uh, to look over that, think about it, and if anybody has any uh, comments, we'll just, uh, you know, take a few minutes for discussion around this and, uh, uh, and, and add and subtract as need be. Terry. I'm wondering a bit what you're thinking would be the, the, the content of the upload of outcomes. Um, so, so would that be something that, that could somehow be automated, that there are summaries of what happens, or is it for each individual in, in use of the CDS, or, or you know, and may, maybe that's a little bit too mechanistic, but I, I guess I'm not seeing how that could be made easy for users, and you'd want it to be really easy for it to happen. So ideally, it's something that the user is completely not aware of and uninvolved and has to take no action other than to do his clinical or her clinical course of duties. And the kinds of measures that are useful to upload include, you know, both the firing of the alert, well, recognition of the state that the alert could fire, the firing of the alert, the acknowledgement or not of the alert, and then a process or downstream measure of whatever the alert recommended, did you do it, and did it have a cost or quality impact? And I think that the, um the question that you're asking then is, you know, uh, we know from um, the work that's being done in eMERGE PGX and others that the process measures there, the firing and the, and the actions in that can be very easily captured. And in fact, most commercial EHRs uh, 
uh, with their decision support are able to develop those types of logs. The challenging piece is, you know, what happened to the patient and how do we aggregate data. And I think we heard Ken talk yesterday about some of the early work looking at how do we retrieve quality uh, measures from electronic health record data. Again, not requiring clinicians to somehow enter it, but to pull that there. And we're very, very early in our ability to do that. And I think most of us would think or say that the quality measures that are being pulled at the present time are relatively trivial and certainly not granular enough to really be able to track back to particular uh, decisions. But I think that we at least have the opportunity to begin to explore how uh, it could uh, move in that direction. So it's not an impossibility. And Dan, you, you want to um, add into that? Yeah. So I, I think the starting point here, sort of the null hypothesis to reject, was the um, uh, empiric discovery by eMERGE that if you use EMR data, you can find a combination of structured data, codes, labs, meds, <clears throat> and then NLP analysis of provider notes to identify a phenotype. And if you think of the desired uh, state of uh, responding to a decision support uh, um, intervention as essentially a phenotype, then you could reuse those same elements and just um, have a decision rule that basically says, if the rule, if this event already occurred, if the rule did fire, now we're looking for this second set of codes, labs, meds, and NLP um, uh, description of some kind of state that yeah. uh, would be meaningful with respect to uh, responding to the rule, or not responding to the rule. <laughs> I have a so does that, does that uh, address your question, Terry? Well, it does, but that to me sounds more like the, the kind of first stage of the process outcomes, did they respond to it or didn't I? What, what I was a little more concerned about was the outcome. So, so you know, how do you assess the, the impact? And that's hard for me to imagine how that could be automated, but, but again, maybe that's a bit more in the weeds and, and we could talk well, about th This is an area it. actually where the, the quality measurement, quality assessment world, and the clinical decision support world really should try to come together. In the NQF work around the quality data management framework, you know, the whole vision was that we would, we would define kind of these atomic objects or subset or classifiers that could be used in numerators or denominators, whether it's on the CDS side of the coin or on the quality measure side of the coin. That connection is, is rarely, if ever, explicitly drawn. And of course, the measures, the actual measures aren't the same or the cohort definition in CDS does not exactly equal the quality measure definition, but they should be related. So I've got JD and then Chris. Yeah, one thing to think about with respect to closing the loop for the, the outcomes data of using the rules is to look at that like we, like we view public health data today in terms of infection control, what have you, to say, okay, every HR system can then provide a download of their rule activity based upon the content they were using to feed back in and close that loop long term. Second thing with respect to using all of these quality measures is to feed CDS work. That came up at the AMIA meeting a couple weeks ago and how we've got this HIPAA log jam in between those two to help get all this great research that's happening over on the quality side over here to be used on the research side. Yeah, I think those are both uh, uh, very good points. Chris. It really <clears throat> gets into what is the definition of your Lego piece. Um, when we did Sharpen, for example, <clears throat> we recognized that clinical decision support, quality metrics, cohort identification, uh, were at the end of the day all effectively cohort identification because quality is a numerator and denominator, they're both cohorts, uh, and decision support is it is for whom the cohort, or for whom the rule should fire, what is that cohort. Uh, in the context of getting interoperability, consistency, and scalability, ONC, I think, has started to recognize that, for example, their a healthy decision, which was based on the virtual medical record, was dissonant with their uh, view of what uh, uh, H query, health query, would look like. They, they were working with different Lego pieces. That in turn, of course, was different from what was happening in meaningful use with CCDs and the like. I think if this is going to generalize, uh, the community really needs to have a consensus on what are the data element pieces that we can agree upon and from there, assemble quality, assemble decision support, assemble various logic types. And the leading candidate this week um, is the partnership between CIMI, the Clinical Information Modeling Initiative, and FIRE, uh, 
which is a physical implementation of effectively that logical model. <clears throat> but I, I think we're not going to make a whole lot of progress uh, in these kinds of building block idealizations until we have agreement on the fundamental units, molecules, if you will, of the underlying <coughs> phenotype characterization. I, Chris, I couldn't agree more. And I guess one thing I'd throw out is to think about the SIMI work and fire work and, and the work that predates it just a little bit, but is still ongoing, and Betsy, I think, is in the room, you know, with the NLM Value Set Authority Center. You know, when we were building the CDSC rules, we found that we were creating value sets all over the place. Everybody does the same thing. You have to define a diabetic, that cohort, with a specification. And if we don't agree upon that specification, we're, we're, you know, we're stuck, as you say. And I wonder, you know, is this part of something like the Value Set Authority Center, or is it something that in the library there are atomic building blocks which we use in our authoring environments to do either quality measures or CDS specification? Betsy, do you want to uh, uh, respond to that since uh, uh, Blackford kind of put you on the spot? Well, I didn't regard him as putting me on the spot, but um, obviously if we decide on what the building blocks are, then uh, we will need repositories of the building blocks. And we, NLM has initially been focused on the value sets and we are now, um, have done some prototyping work on the next up, which would be the sort of common data element part. And as we know, a variety of uh, organizations, NHGRI in, in the lead with Fenex, have, have looked at common data elements. And there is work ongoing to sort of look at across these different efforts and see if we can bring the NIH groups um, uh, to uh, greater agreement <coughs> across them. And I think that that's possible. And then the issue is, how does that marry up with the uh, common data elements that people are interested in outside in um, various types of uh, patient safety reporting and um, uh, quality measurement. So I certainly do think that um, working toward uh, a common definition of how these should be defined and then then making them available to people for reuse is, is important. Yeah, so I've got uh, Josh and Clem and Chris. And so Josh, I'll go with you first since uh, I was, I'm assuming you're probably going to be talking a little bit about some of the Fenex and, and other work of that type, or maybe not. <laughs> um, uh, two points. So, so, so the first was um, uh, related kind of this idea of these buildings, how we would do this process and closed loop part of it. You know, to my knowledge, and, and, and I certainly um, am not an expert in this, so I would invite uh, correction here. I don't think there is a standard around how we report that micro-level um, querying of what happens to uh, what happens when the user interacts with CDS. So I don't think these are queryable elements in sort of NQF uh, formats or HL7 or that sort of thing. I think everybody has their own thing. So, so even the sort of ability to aggregate up and do that would be, you know, would be hard today. Um, you know, a lot of movements have obviously been done around the quality um, forums and, um, and how to get quality metrics. And I, I was just going to say on that and re regards to value sets and that sort of thing that, you know, the, the way you define these things depends on which circle you sit in. You know, in Emerge, we want very high, accurate, precise phenotypes and we don't worry as much generally about getting great recall. A lot of the quality metrics don't necessarily worry about having a PPV that's quite so high. And, um, and, and, but, you know, maybe want more recall. And, and a systematic way of approaching it that can be applied across many systems is more preferred. So, so you know, it's, it's interesting when you think about the value sets as we've done work with value sets and representations using HQMF um, uh, via uh, compared to merge phenotypes that, that you'll, you'll look at the same problem different ways. And, and I don't think that's necessarily a problem. I just think it's something to be aware of. Well, a couple of things. It smells a little bit like the exceptionalism that uh, we heard about yesterday when you make this a separate thing, recognition for genotype, phenotype. You know, it's just finding patterns in the record. And of course, the phenotype is just a general way to say everything you want to find in the clinical record. It's, and it's fairly ill-defined. Uh, and I think the element that you'll find in lec records now is closest to an OBX. It's the part of SIMI, the little element within SIMI. Uh, but there's 
panels in, in records, which might be analogous to what's in SIMI. And, if, and th there's issues then, so that's, you'll find that in every medical record system, these little things with name value pairs, which says this is a diastolic blood pressure, or this is the result of the prothrombin, you know, bad uh, mutation. Uh, and those things can be aggregated with the logic. So I think we have to be careful about putting too much into, uh, locking too much into the building blocks higher up, but having a good logic that can put them together. It's sort of what Chris was talking about, because it's the same thing looked at many ways, and if we make subsystems that are all different, no one will be able to support it. Now there's a second question, is trying to standardize the elements, these little bitty elements that are in all these records across records, and we've tried to do that with LOINC. Uh, this, the common data elements is another activity, especially for research kinds of things that aren't always found in medical records, to do the same kind of thing. So I don't know if that helps, but. Yeah, yeah and, and I think that, you know, clearly some of the things that we've been uh, um, uh, looking at in terms of uh, assembling phenotypes from, uh, from more elemental particles as opposed to starting with the phenotype and then building off because, again, we see these things that we, you know, like blood pressure and weight and that that are present in so many of the different phenotypes. So, so to have a library of those that can, you know, be pulled, I think, is, is one of the things that, you know, could make this potentially uh, easier. I've got Mark. Chris Mark. and then Lee and... Can I just respond to Clem quickly, too? Uh, it's a great point, Clem, and I, you know, I'm, I'm reticent to jump headfirst into the quicksand of the curly braces uh, problem. And for, for those of you who aren't informaticians living in that world, this is where local representation has to somehow be mapped to a, a, a standard form. And I think that there's an implementation detail here that might be, you know, able to move beyond the curly braces problem with sort of an edge, you know, edge uh, uh, case and, and whatnot. But we can come to that later. Okay, Chris, and then... <clears throat> okay, I have uh, three points, the first two dealing with, with dogs and tails. Uh, for those of you that know my career, uh, I, nobody could be more committed to vocabulary uh, than I have been. Uh, and uh, value sets, of course, are, are the best thing since uh, the dawn of uh, something. Uh, <laughs> however, Stan Huff has taught me, uh, much to my chagrin, uh, that the value sets are the tail. And the dog is really the clinical model to you, which you bind a specific value sets. Value sets without context are meaningless. Yeah. And the, the, the context is defined by those micro models. So in the SIMI and FIRE stuff, it's value sets that are bound to those structures that become relevant. And those are the things that should be curated and, and met. Uh, having value sets without any binding to a model is, is a, a purposeless exercise. So it's value sets are the tail. The second thing is this relationship between data elements and research, be it for genomics or cohort identification or whatever, <clears throat> and uh, standards and other relationships in um, clinical practice. It's my, it's become my mission to try to persuade the research community that they should give up making uh, data elements and that they should adopt the data elements that are being created in the clinical space. And if they don't work, have the clinicals underpinning clinical standard changed to accommodate the research use case rather than make research data elements. Because it is inevitable that we will have a dissonance between a research perspective on clinical data and a clinical perspective on clinical data. And if we think about ACOs, if we think about quality management, if we think about all those things, they're really research methodology applied to clinical data, albeit not necessarily for a research use case. And the, the underlying physical structure should be identical. <coughs> Finally, Josh's point that, you know, we can't all aggregate things similarly today because we have different baselines and structures. I could not agree more. However, that's not where we want to be. And to the extent that we can define a common API, to the extent that we can make, if you will, all EHRs at the end of the day black boxes that will respond similarly to queries and inquiries, uh, ideally premised on something like a semi-fire uh, query model, then it doesn't matter that we have a differentiation within uh, because if they're using the same common elements, if they're using the same query interfaces, that is the evolutionary state we have to aspire toward. Uh, and I think it would be a lot easier if the research community were to partner with the clinical community to define what that state might be. Thanks, Lee. Um, I, I want to make a point of um, 
the, uh, in the first point of uh, uh, knowledge representation, I'm wondering um, whether the, the report, um, for example, interpretation of the uh, uh, genomic results on the report, uh, should be also part of the knowledge representation. Uh, because I see all the elements you put here right now, though, still uh, are trying to standardize the terms in the EMR. But what I'm saying, interpretation of those um, genomic tests, those things should. Would that also be a part of the standardization as well? Yeah, I think that's a, a very good point. Um, and so if I would maybe, and so Jackie, uh, this would be for the fir first bullet, add a sub-bullet, and I'll just kind of frame this on the fly as uh, um, uh, 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 representation of genetic and genomic results and, um, um, uh, and uh, related to the limbs or uh, laboratory information management system or something like that because we recognize that while we use the overarching term EHR, um, those of us that do this know that the limbs and the EHR frequently don't play well uh, <laughs> together, um, and that's, uh, that is an issue. So I think that that would be, uh, would be worth adding. I wanted to, to uh, just scroll back uh, for, for just a bit. First of all, Terry, um, I'm sure you're really glad you asked your question. <laughs> um, <laughs> given that you were avalanched under a, 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 a volume of, uh, of acronyms, as we just so love to do. Uh, but I think uh, that was really a key question because, to me, that really talks about something that there is considerable passion uh, uh, about around the room and in some ways I think is very helpful from a prioritization perspective. So um, with that editorial comment, any other, um, uh, uh, Ken, reflection? And uh, apologies for being late. I was putting out a work fire all night. Um, hmm. Just to, and apologies if, if this overlaps, but just responding to what Chris said about um, the models are where it's at and do not overlap work. I'd say having work in, worked in standards about a long time, probably worse than having no standard is s different, but similar standards, it might be worse. Um, <laughs> and we are dealing with so many consequences of having to try to take similar but different standards and trying to merge them because you simply can't map them one to one. You almost never can do it. I, my recommendation here is if you think you're creating a similar but different standard, don't and work with this group, group that has the standard and, and have that change because otherwise we'll have another effort five years from now where we're saying, well, we have so many standards to choose from, let's start over again. So we might want to add uh, something. We, we don't have any uh, sort of caveats and lessons learned, but maybe we need to create a slide of caveats and lessons learned. <laughs> Uh, and, and what I'm really taking away from this, uh, from your comment and from Chris's and others, is that um, while we have these funded research projects uh, and where we're creating um, uh, phenotypes, that what we really need to do at our individual institutions is to not uh, separate ourselves from the clinical work but say, okay, this is what we're trying to do, what's happening in the clinical space, and try and reconcile uh, those so that we have a shared understanding of what that phenotype is so it could be used in either the research or the clinical side. Uh, is that a, a fair way of stating that? I, I think so. Um, what typically happens is people come from slightly different perspectives. Like here's the clinical research realm, here's the distance support quality measurement, data exchange, and we all have slightly different approaches. And honestly, it's usually not because there's actually different requirements. It's usually just because you're working with different groups. Yeah. Brian? I, I think that actually that the actually practically testing that can be a challenge. I know in the, in the CSER group, uh, we were discussing potential future projects and somebody said, hey, why don't we just, I think it was me actually who said, hey, why don't we just, just get our data and see if we can hand it off to another CSER group and see if they can do the same thing that we're doing on our, our data or, or they can do the same thing we're doing on somebody else's data. And it was, it was roundly dismissed. Um, and I think it was because people realized how little interoperability there was in anything that we were doing. Um, where when we're talking about genomic medicine, um, you know, if, if the genome really is the one test to rule them all, then um, you know, much of what we're, what we're talking about relies on, on real interoperability. And that needs to be tested. Um, not just by the people who developed it, but by somebody else who didn't develop it, who has a different data set that, that can, can look at the stand, whatever standards were created and say, does this actually work at a different institution? 
And I think that's dramatically different than how you know, projects are done and grants are given. Um, um, and now maybe that goes into the, the next hour discussion, but, but the, the defining what interoperability means um, is, is, is really key um, because if, <coughs> if, 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 if I can define what interoperability means for myself, then in the end I can be like Epic that just hired a lobbyist to convince Congress that they're interoperable. Um, and that, that's one definition of interoperability. Um, but I think that, that real interoperability is something that needs to be tested um, and needs to be tested on multiple systems and, and can't just, you, you can't just say it's going to be interoperability because we've defined it to be interoperabil interoperable with our, within our own system. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a good point. And I think one of the things that was really um, very uh, prescient about uh, the eMERGE was the idea that, you know, right from the get-go, the idea was that, you know, the phenotypes are going to be created, they're going to be tested, and at least across that consortium that they would be interoperable. Now, um, you know, a lot of those phenotypes are now available, you know, through public, uh, publicly accessible things, but I don't know that we've systematically looked to say, are others using them? Do they actually work outside of uh, the eMERGE group? And that would be something that, again, could be, uh, I think, relatively easily tested, at least as a proof of principle, that uh, even these types of phenotypes that are developed in a research setting uh, could, in fact, be developed in such a way that anybody with a certified EHR and a data warehouse could, uh, could, could use them. I think eMERGE really actually is a very good example of, of a, a strong attempt at interoperability, but could, could even, like you said, go the next step to see can it even work outside that group. Yeah, I agree. Dan. Well, so uh, to carry on with, with eMERGE and respond to Joss's comment, <clears throat> so it seems to me that the major opportunity and or blind spot, if you will, <clears throat> in phenotype specifications are things that would be kind of I intermediate uh, physiological states. So you have a rule to reduce the risk of uh, renal insufficiency due to antibiotics or something. So you have to be able to recognize is uh, renal function deteriorating. Most of the phenotypes to date are kind of diagnostic entities. Um, and so these are things where you don't have the likelihood, for example, that there would be an ICD code that gets you in the neighborhood. Um, but with respect to the idea that eMERGE was not, was not worried about uh, false negatives, right? So you were trying to go for high specificity, positive predictive value. You didn't really worry about the ones you missed. It seems to me you, we would have that problem if you're trying to make sure you identify every case of the, the dependent downstream um, observable set of characteristics, i.e. phenotype. But it's kind of healthy in the sense that what it does is give a conservative bias to the interpretation of the impact of the rule, right? Because it may be that if you can't find the, the salutary effect that breast cancer didn't occur or the patient lived, um, uh, that what, what happens is it's interpreted as, as the, the rule having less effect than it really had for almost all of those cases where you miss, the, you miss the, their false negatives. In other words, you don't find them, but they actually were a good outcome. That may be, I mean, you have to look at the use cases of classes of these downstream outcomes of uh, decision support, and you, and you could have sets of them to see how robust phenotype detection would be in, for different kinds of states in the EMR. But it's a kind of a nice research problem that extends the work of eMERGE, which was at the level of diagnoses in most cases. Sue? I just want to make a comment that, you know, in, interoperability has different levels. And I, and I think, you know, if you just, if you don't understand and we don't interoperate useful information that's for clinical care, right, then it's, it's easy to say we accomplish interoperability but not on very useful information. So I would hope there's a separate discussion or there's some discussion in terms of what's useful information that we should exchange for the care of the patient, especially in this area of genomics. I think in, in the EHR, it's quite simple that we try to exchange everything. But given the volume of information in genomic medicine, right, it's often not possible to exchange everything. And given the implications of the time span, right, that is not episodic, but over a, a large period of time, right, it, it gets even harder as we have multiple encounters with the patient, right, and trying to determine over the, over the lifetime of the patient, right, what information should we appropriately send or what information should we appropriately request 
for the care of the patient. So, so I think you know that's something that some effort should be spent looking at that. Good. I think that we're. I'm, I'm sorry, Quinn. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I just, I'd like to, to weigh in with both Ken's comment and the interoperability discussion, and that. Um, and I think we, we so often make up these parallel worlds and everybody says, well, we'll map them together later. And it doesn't happen and it can't happen. And so I just couldn't be more strongly reinforce a stop being unique across the world. And, in, and I think there's a big risk of it in this area because of the exceptionalism. But in terms of interoperability, I think the word is kind of useless <clears throat> because in its complete form, you got to have your business rules and everything else lined up, and it, it doesn't happen. So if you've got some uh, an order going over to a hospital, and you're assuming there's somebody on call who's going to handle the problems when there's something happens, and it may not be the same at another hospital. But if we focus down, maybe it's more toward the point of what what does the data look like? Just sending the data, not worrying about the time frames or the reactions or stats and all these other variations. I think we can actually get agreement on things. But it, it's a it's a big huge word and everybody throws it around and I don't think it's very helpful unless we narrow it a little bit. <clears throat> Great. Um, so I think it sounds like we're we're pretty we're pretty good with these. Um, uh, it sounds like there's no one that's identified anything that uh, we've completely uh, fanned on, uh, and I think we've identified a couple of things that are obviously. Uh, of great interest to the group that we'll circle back to at the end when we start to talk about potential projects. So why don't we go ahead and, and uh, move through uh, some of the uh, individual session uh, syntheses and go from there. Okay, so uh, question two with Bob and, and Jim talked about the data issues. And based upon you know, a very rich discussion again, and some of which we've touched on uh, again this morning, um, try to establish this hierarchical set of knowledge representation and technical standards. Um, the relationship between the data issues and the knowledge management issues obviously is closely intertwined. Uh, define these standard trigger events. What will be the event triggering GCDS? And we talked a lot about that. Define methods to maintain provenance of the data and knowledge. Have sufficient metadata around the data constructs and the knowledge artifacts so that their provenance and lifespan can be well defined and managed. Assure the interoperability, sorry Clem, of data elements between record systems. Recognizing patients are mobile, uh, data must be available where the patient's being cared for, and also family members and descendants um, may have interest in these data as well. And one of, the, one of the things I like to say is that not only should we have interoperability around data, but the knowledge as well, so that the right data, right knowledge is available wherever. Uh, assess the current and future legal, regulatory, policy environment and address the obstacles. Uh, we had rich discussion about, you know, when to exchange data across uh, care environments and kind of the political and financial barriers to those kinds of things. The business case uh, came up. Uh, and then the public health role. How do these data pertaining to the genomic state or uh, uh, inference around genomics not only relate to the individual patient, but the longitudinal care of that patient, and then even the generational uh, impact of those inferences or those data and that understanding, and does that um, therefore impact potentially public health considerations for uh, different genomic states? Anything to add there? No, I think that that's, um, uh, I think that's a good uh, overall kind of, any, uh, yeah, uh, Brandon. <clears throat> I think one thing I want to point out when we're talking about defining the trigger events uh, for, you know, for genomic CDS is that we don't reinvent um, work that's already being do done out there. Um, I, I think what we need to do, uh, we don't need another Adam, Adam's right, or Adam Wright's uh, paper on uh, types of decision support. What we need is to look at um, the different workflows that will involve genomic information and figure out how we can plug in or utilize these different types of decision support triggers so that they can be supportive of genomically guided care uh, and use genomic information. So um, instead of, again, reinventing the wheel, just kind of using the wheels that are out there and shaping them for uh, genomics and genomic information. Yeah, and, and uh, thanks for that. We uh, actually, as we, again, we get to the end, that was one of the things that we did pull out as a potential area for research investigation, looking at it in precisely the way that you just articulated it, which is we, we have the toolbox, but what we really don't know is which tool to use when, 
uh, and under what circumstances. So that's, uh, I, that, I think that is an area that clearly from the discussion people were very interested in and would be something that could probably be moved forward relatively quickly. Ken. Just to uh, add to that, so um, there are some existing lines of work and I think beyond just defining the events, we need a mechanism to actually consume and publish those events. Um, so uh, standard-wise, uh, the info button standard includes a set of contexts of for doing that kind of distance support. So that's a starting point that's already a standard. There's also an event communication and subscriptions service standard that's now a draft standard, just validated in September. Uh, and that includes an open source implementation created by the VA in a sandbox. So we already even have a, not only a standard in this area, a draft standard, but actually an implementation that's open source. So I, I'd recommend um, uh, that this community work with that group and probably just with HL7 to piggyback on what's already been worked on for about two years. Right, and so uh, again, one of the points of uh, putting up uh, on the second slide, you know, the fact that our second objective was accomplished because we identified all of these different opportunities, I would say that underlying anything that we're suggesting here is that, that we would immediately seek out and collaborate with those groups that are already in this space, whether they're in it from the perspective of, if you will, general CDS versus genomic CDS so that we can take advantage and not, uh, um, you know, reinvent the, uh, the wheel to use a cliched uh, <laughs> uh, uh, term. So uh, I think we can uh, let's assume that as a given for the purposes of discussion going forward. As we begin to drill down and identify specific projects, then we may want to specifically call out, okay, here are the other groups that we need to involve in a project that we all as a group decide should move forward in some way. I guess just, Brandon, one follow-up comment on, on uh, our, our paper on the partners, CDS types. You know, I would keep an open mind, and I'm not a geneticist. But it seems to me that some of the uncertainty management issues will be different than kind of the classical inference that we do for all the rest of decision support. And that might suggest, you know, a new paradigm for things that we may have to figure out. Okay. So this is about the knowledge management. Wanna? Right. So uh, this was a, a tool, and uh, Josh led this. Um, and uh, again, the key questions were, uh, you know, what are the necessary elements of knowledge, uh, representation to achieve the ideal state, um, what standards exist, uh, what type of decision support architecture is needed, and governance issues. And this was uh, a very fascinating discussion that uh, about the first 75 minutes uh, uh, was pretty, uh, uh, was uh, without form and void to some degree, and then uh, we uh, suddenly had uh, a, a, and, uh, a let there be light moment, I think, to some degree, and we're able to pull out um, uh, some synthetic elements that I think are, are useful. Uh, one uh, is to study the uh, implemented genetic genomic information to develop standard standardized ways to represent knowledge, and we identified um, some specific areas that uh, uh, seem to be ripe uh, for this. The IOM Action Collaborative, by the way, I, I should uh, uh, inform the group as a whole that uh, um, uh, Blackford and I were um, um, kidnapped uh, by <laughs> Sandy and JD to be a part of this. So we will, uh, one of the, uh, we can chalk up as an action item that uh, there will be a direct uh, a, a relationship from this meeting to the IOM Action Collaborative related to that. So may as well declare victory on that one <laughs> as well. Um, uh, data sourcing and portability, that's, uh, the portability issue is, is obviously a recurring one. Um, uh, the, uh, the representation of uh, uh, AHRQ and ANC, uh, given that they're standing up uh, for immunizations, uh, uh, a national CDS for immunizations that will be able to be consumed by any certified EHR, and the invitation uh, that we received to say, hey, if you have a few uh, genomic CDS use cases, you know, let's see if we can put them up there and see what happens. So I think that's a really interesting opportunity. Um, this was uh, somewhat provocative, and we didn't um, necessarily talk about this very much, but um, we were talking about a time, not now, but in the future, where if we do, in fact, understand some of the elements of successful uh, 
genomic CDS that as projects that are funded by uh, Genome or NIH, much as we're required to deposit data in dbGaP, the genomic data, that if we develop CDS as part of this work, that there be a requirement that this uh, be deposited in an open source repository. Again, a lot of presumptions, one, that we know how to build them in a standardized way, two, that there actually is a national repository. Um, but I think that this is something that at some point down the future could be very powerful in terms of moving more things uh, into the uh, space. Um, there was a lot of interest in the idea of wh where do the data come from? Um, in traditional genetic testing, uh, from panels, from direct-to-consumer testing, but I think that there's a recognition um, that more and more we're going to be having data that's coming out of exomes and genomes. And so the question is, is if we have that type of information, uh, then how can we feed that information to CDS uh, systems across a variety of different um, questions? And so uh, we could develop some test cases uh, across the different uh, funded projects to explore how this might uh, be done, taking certain uh, elements. Uh, we've got a PGX projects in Ignite, Emerge uh, has a PGX project. Uh, Caesar uh, and the newborn sequencing are pulling other types of genomic data. So could we link uh, that? And then we have undiagnosed uh, diseases program that is going to be looking at rare and ultra rare uh, disorders. So how could that be used to potentially generate uh, CDS? So there's a lot of different use cases that could be developed uh, out of um, these different projects to kind of span the, the globe of possibility. And then I think there's, uh, and, and this was reflected in where we started uh, on the, the first slide, the need to really do this end-to-end -end project where we go all the way from standing up a CDS rule to saying how does it really impact uh, patient outcomes? You know, what, do we, what are all the steps that are needed to successfully do this, some of which will be relatively easy and that we have tools for today, some of which will be uh, quite challenging and that we're going to have to uh, sort things out. But this is uh, ultimately where we need to go because it doesn't do us any good to continually say, well, we think this is going to be really beneficial for people based on the fact that we're smart people and, and we have a strong belief system that this is going to work. <laughs> um, you know, in God we trust, uh, all others bring data, time for to generate a little data yeah. uh, in this area. Um, and so uh, this is something that I think is really rising to the, uh, to the top. Uh, will be challenging, but one of the things that we should be thinking about there is, uh, you know, if we think about projects that involve, okay, well, let's look at cancer prevention. Well, now we're looking at a timeline of, of patient outcomes that is decades, um, whereas there may be other projects that we could test how to do this that would have uh, an impact that could be realized over a much shorter time frame. So I think selection of what the pilots could be here will be critical. So that's sort of the synthesis around uh, key question three. Any uh, questions, comments, uh, discussion around this? Terry. <laughs> so I'm curious about the end-to-end the -end project based on CDS, because one of the, when you, when you think about what question you're testing, it's, it's going to be hard, I think, to distinguish between did the CDS work or did the genetic test work. And, and so, so how, and maybe you don't need to distinguish between those. Maybe it's one big package. But, you know, if we wait for genetic tests to be proven to have an impact on outcome, we're going to be waiting a long time, I think, before we can yeah. implement CDS. So do, you, so do you have any thoughts on, yeah. on you know, how, how and whether we need to distinguish those questions? You know, so one of the things in the classic, you know, kind of CDS research is to look at a process impact, uh, which can occur hopefully near term after the CDS intervention and may or may not relate to a, to a quality outcome downstream. And process measures, things like, you know, number of uh, adverse drug events or number of CPOE orders and adverse drug events detected, near misses, serious misses, et cetera. Um, same kinds of things could apply here. Did the genetic inference, uh, was it acknowledged? Was it acted upon? Was a process uh, event measurable? And that's all before you get to actually a clinical impact. Right. So it seems that the, the process outcomes would be pretty easy to distinguish the test impact versus the, the CDS impact. But when it comes to ultimately, yeah. did you make people better or, you know, did you avert a death or whatever, I don't see how you can distinguish the two. So maybe I can help. 
you know, the, we're sort of linking this in a binary fashion that we have one observable downstream state uh, and we get to choose one and only one. But you can imagine, for example, prompts related um, to cancer where you have, or any disease, uh, a chronic disease that, that has mortality that might be one of the hard endpoints, but that occurs after a lot of other things happen. So that having a kind of nested cat, multi, multiple occurrences model for things that you could look for uh, that would link to the decision support event would allow you to combine uh, a mixture of hard endpoints that might represent somebody lived or died, as well as intermediate process variables. So it's not an XOR right. that you do one or the other. You could devise the data structures and a surveillance, in a kind of event-based surveillance that could look for, continue to look for those things over long periods of time. So the, the library continues to accrue value as people live out their lives. Uh, and so it doesn't have to be cross-sectional. It, it, it benefits from the inherent longitudinal capabilities of EMRs. Josh? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, say that it's really important to not only measure process outcomes, but understand why people take particular actions, because the reason there may be outcome differences uh, based on particular genetic variation is often dependent on the, the uh, potential confounding by indication at the point of, of taking an action. So you have to understand both phases. Yeah, but I think the point is um, important that um, if, we, if we choose uh, an example where uh, we're saying, well, you know, we really don't know if this genetic test you know, predicts this outcome. If we do this in relation to genetic tests, it predicts an outcome or not, and we're going to use uh, a CDS methodology to, you know, sort of test that. It may be much more difficult to separate out, you know, was it the test or was it the, uh, the process, as opposed to taking something where there's a, you know, what we would deem a sufficient amount of evidence to say that, we, that there is an impact on on outcomes and then look at, you know, the implementation. So I think there are different ways that you could uh, approach it. At the end of the day, if you think about it from the patient perspective, if the outcome is better, to some degree, who cares exactly what it was that, that got you to that point? Um, and that's in some ways, a, in a very superficial and, and somewhat uh, pejorative way, the difference between quality improvement and research. In research, the question is we really want to understand precisely why we got the outcome where we got, whereas with quality improvement, we're more about um, uh, making the system work so that we get the outcomes that we want, and we're less interested in what different components of the system contributed to that particular outcome. Paul. It's likely already planned, but in that end-to-end -end project that you're suggesting, um, it, that would be a great way of determining the standards and knowledge standards, that sort of thing. I would think that all the, um, the discussion about figuring out the standard workflow and standard triggers and defining the use cases would come first, and then this would also test those standard approaches. Thank you. Ken? I, th I think um, uh, just to note on the confounding of distance support with the the genetic testing, I think it depends on the, the intervention you're talking about. If it's a simple genetic test that docs can just remember what the algorithm is, has less than seven pieces of information that are being used at one time, then I think it makes sense to test the genetic test separately from the distance support. I think it's in the cases where using those genetic tests and figuring out how to use them, you can't really conceive of how you could do it without distance support. Well, then distance support's part of the intervention. It's so uh, the caveat is that a lot of distance support interventions just fail because nobody uses them or ignores them, so that needs to be really closely tracked. And, and I think if we, if we had the capability to really track whether or not it was, it was followed, then you could disentangle, you know. It, at least you could say maybe this failed because people didn't follow decision right. support. On the other hand, you, you could say it failed and, we, and they perfectly followed decision support. Then you go back to your genetic yeah. test probably doesn't make a difference. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right about that. And that's why, as Dan, I think, pointed out, it's critically important to capture all of that information because then you do, uh, you are able to learn more rapidly. I'll go to Dan and then Jim. And then so Josh. I still think actually uh, when, when you class these outcomes, you may have the ability to infer causality. Mm 
it was the decision to port alert that caused the favorable downstream. But, you, but even if you can't uh, establish causality, it becomes essentially a kind of biomarker of, of process, and, and that, if, that when the decision support was associated with one set of factors that cause perhaps a favorable set of outcomes, but, but you may not be able to assign causality directly to decision support, in a sense, I'm still happy, right? Because, because it, it, now you've, you've been able to measure things and, and know that it, even if it's, if it's not directly, the, the, the CDS was a directly the cause of the favorable improved relative to people that didn't you know, follow it, then uh, it, you, if you, it, you're still in a good position of having been able to do a kind of health service, services research relative to quality. And so I, and that was a long-winded way of saying, I think getting un, uh, unduly hung up in, in having to establish a clear causal relationship between the intervention uh, in or, before we believe it's uh, useful and valuable is probably holding ourselves to an unnecessarily high s standard for whether we've made the world a better place. Although it may reflect the fact that uh, um, our uh, payer friends tend to hold us to that standard that sensitizes us. Jim? So when I see um, process standards, I'm wondering if you include standards for the representation of the processes in a, in a, in a computable way. So that, for instance, I don't want to write a medical logic module for every drug or every SNP. I want to write a med medical logic med module that says, somebody's ordering this drug, what does the genetic information and the knowledge tell me I should do in terms of dose modification or recommendations or something? But not, you know, have that sort of a dynamic process, not, and it would have to be standardized to do that. Yeah. Uh, Josh. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting point. I, I think it remains to be seen in some ways how much we could generalize it. I mean, I think it's, um, and it also gets to the idea of all these external knowledge bases like farm GKP and things like that that aren't necessarily held in a computable format, but they could be, um, and what the future applications could be. Uh, right now, if you look at what happens within PREDICT, I mean, there are all specific things carefully worded for okay. every drug genome interaction, which is, you know, obviously not scalable if we think about all the potential things we eventually could learn. Eventually, it could be like drug-drug interactions. The other thing I was thinking about, just kind of building off what Josh and, and Dan had been saying, um, you know, so, so the specific case that Josh was talking about, if you, uh, and, and yesterday uh, we talked a little bit about uh, if, if you look at, for instance, and predict over a course of time about 55 percent of people that are poor metabolizers um, on clopidogrel with uh, sub 2 c 19 poor metabolizers get switched to an alternative agent. But if you, you know, but, but there are known contraindications to prasugrel, which is the drug that's been around the longest for there. And when you remove those people with, that are older, have had prior strokes, things like that, you know, that number is closer to 70 percent get switched. And, and what strikes me about that particular story is um, the, the fact that the EHR has the information within it to answer the question as to why people didn't follow the decision support, the, you know, recommendation. And, and um, I, I think, you know, the cool thing about the potential for doing this kind of closed loop process is as you accumulate um, decisions, you can look at what associates with those decisions in a more automated way and, and build up, you know, temporality metrics as well as diagnostic metrics, you know, demographic metrics. And, and this could all kind of run in a kind of real-time data mining you know, networky kind of fashion, and as you discover those things at the back end, which you can't necessarily do once it's aggregated out in like what happens in like quality reporting, but you certainly can do locally, and you actually could do it when it's aggregated out depending on what you share. Great. Jeff? Two uh, quick comments. Uh, one on bullet three, I'd like uh, perhaps to capture the notion of, um, of an economic analysis uh, as part of this to build the business case and also the notional idea of doing the uh, doing this demo uh, whatever the projects end up being as pragmatic clinical trials so that we understand uh, the value proposition and on uh, bullet two I, I'd like to expand the suite of of potential uh, areas to include cancer which is not really represented in, in that a series of projects, and, and also infectious disease, the uh, notion of microbial sequencing for diagnosis is important. And thirdly, uh, things like risk stratification through family history. 
Okay, so Jackie, I'm going to give you some specific. So for the bullet three, uh, add economic um, slash business and pragmatic trial Two different methodology. And then to bullet two, um, uh, add, uh, um, can, can I, could I expand that to somatic uh, uh, sequencing? Yeah. So I just wanted to note that three of the CSER projects are actually doing somatic sequencing. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, and so, but we didn't, I think it's better to be explicit than implicit there. So uh, we'll, we'll add the somatic and then um, uh, the second one was? Microbial, microbial, microbial sequencing. Uh, sequencing. Um, so those are additional use cases that would be, uh, that would be desirable. Yeah. Quick comment. Yeah. You know, uh, this, this notion of how do we measure or assess the impact of the CDS intervention goes kind of well beyond even all the things we've been chatting about. Certainly the IOM report, uh, Building Safer Systems, described the socio-technical context, environmental, training, uh, physical, uh, as well as the EMR and usability issues itself. So one notion is, do we really want to treat the EMR as a black box? Or do we wish to define sort of the standard instrumentation that would apply to each and every EMR and define kind of these outputs that we need for these kinds of analyses? In other words, could the EMR, you know, produce uh, uh, logs, usage logs that are then standardized in some way for those key things that we wish to measure from the EMR use itself? I don't think we've ever really thought about that. Certainly every EMR has some kind of, of uh, logs of use and whatnot, but if we were to define that set of, you know, instrumentation measures we wish to have for every EMR, mm -hmm. it might really support the research uh, that we're considering here. Yeah, so definitely. If you look at it from the eyes of, that's why I brought up the notion of public health reporting. If you look at it, that same type of vehicle and say, okay, here's the data sets that we need, which most likely are captured in every EMR today, you can have a convenient vehicle to get that data expressed on a timely fashion. So let's, uh, Jackie, let's add that. It may not be most appropriate to be on this slide, but just so we make sure we uh, 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 capture it. So it would be standardization of um, EMR process of measures. EMR processes. Um, measures. Measures. E EMR process measures. So, Casey? Um, I just, uh, so I really like the idea of going from end to end for some of these projects. I think what we'll find is that um, is that there'll be a lot of uh, unstructured data that we'll be interested in to, to, that'll need to be structured, so maybe engaging the NLP community in some of this so that we can get at the data that we need to trigger the decision support. And um, I'm not sure if this falls under the data issues or, or under this uh, knowledge management. Um, yeah, area. and I think that, um, uh, that that's a really good uh, point. I'd probably just for a, a placeholder, just uh, Jackie, add that to the sub bullet under uh, bullet three. <coughs> you just say um, unstructured, uh, um, study of unstructured data, mm -hmm. something of that nature as a placeholder. Mark and then Ken. Thanks, Mark. A um, couple of things. The, the logging systems in EHRs are primarily for troubleshooting. So the requirements should raise the bar in terms of what those logs need to capture, how accessible. James and I were talking about some work at St. Jude where there's definitely, um, to bring a troubleshooting resource to a research resource, there's some, some work that would be required. So, so some further thoughts needed around that. Second thing is that um, years ago we did a study on HIV genotyping as a prototype for um, uh, genome and scribe prescribing and found high frequency of um, non-compliant medication orders that were contraindicated by the uh, viral genotype, but we went back and surveyed those physicians. In many cases, it was an error and they admitted that. Other cases, it was salvage therapy. That was in the absence of decision support, but I think that was a, a good way to start to understand the dynamics and that's referenced in the, in the book. And the third point to the notion of fishing out um, what is CDS, what is genetic testing. Most CDS systems, it's not an all or none rollout. So you can have a clinic where the CDS is running and another clinic where it's not running, but all clinics have the genetic test available. So you can do, 
experiments of that nature, or you can have one modality in one clinic and another modality in another clinic. So the infrastructure can support doing that type of analysis and experiment. Right, and, and uh, that is, you know, very naturally maps to what Jeff was talking about in terms of the pragmatic trial cluster randomization and these sorts of things. So that's a really good point. Ken. I really like the logging issue, but just a few caveats. I mean, what's logged depends on what options there are for people to oftentimes to say, like, this is what I did or I think it's wrong, and that's usually customer defined, so just being aware of that. And the other issue is a phenomenon that seems to happen a lot is, you, is people see an alert or a reminder and they actually cancel out. So if you just looked at logs, you might think it had no impact, but then they're actually checking some more data and then actually doing what you recommended. So it's, it's, it's just a caveat and perhaps what we really just want is the other data so we can actually tell whether the, in a, in a sequence of time after something was shown, the intended outcome occurred because if you just look to see if somebody said, okay, I'll do it and I'll push a button to make it happen or cancel, you'll oftentimes get misleading results. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And, and one of the, again, recurring elements that I've heard over the course of yesterday and today has been um, that we need to make some investment uh, much more uh, on the, uh, with the user and to take advantage of some of our um, uh, uh, tools with uh, um, uh, qualitative research methodologies and, and uh, some of the quantitative methods and user interface studies, which we haven't done as much of uh, in the context of the projects that we're currently doing. But look at the targeted audience and then, you know, begin to understand how they're thinking about these. And it's, it's a pretty standard practice in, um, uh, in uh, EHR research, it's just we haven't done it as much in the context of some of the genomic uh, projects that, uh, that have been done, and that is something that also we move to um, uh, sort of our last slide about you know, more overarching projects that could uh, be taken away. Clem. Well, <clears throat> to the, to the, the first point about having a standardized processes for what the computer is doing, I think that's the right direction, but I think what we're, I've heard is we really want standardized or some minimum set of data captured per event and then the process of how you analyze that to discern what the process will, will be inventive things that people will figure out and recognizing that you can't get everything you want. Um, and then uh, the idea of doing parallel studies has been my a pet thing for a long time, uh, if not randomized. And it is possible, especially because rollout usually is, is in waves. And I think we ought to think hard about it because it solves a lot of the problems of some of the other realities. And uh, the third thing is decision support usually doesn't know everything it needs to know. So one approach is to say, well, we'll make the physician put it in, and of course then they get home at midnight instead of 11.30 at night, and so there's a reaction. And so the systems really have to build something like nursing gathers this or that if you really want these things to hit it on the nose. We only had one study that was a 90% penetrant, and that was the one where the infectious disease guys collected all the data re related to MRSA, and it was perfect, and everybody knew it was perfect. But anything else was less than perfect, and so we got 50, 40, 30 percent, you know, responses. Great. Uh, why don't we move on to KQ4? Um, so this was uh, implementation issues. Uh, Ken and Casey uh, ran this group. Um, uh, we've already talked about some of the workflow uh, issues, and so I think we're going to, again, see some uh, recurring themes. Uh, so this is actually a nice transition. Uh, we talked uh, uh, earlier about um, when Brandon brought up the idea that we have different approaches. Uh, what we need to do is uh, test these in different cases and then also look at what are the end user needs and, and learn from that. So we've really kind of discussed that, I think, pretty well. Uh, we've uh, talked over the idea of what are the return on investment, the business cases, what problems are we trying to solve, um, and, and again, uh, ex what are the extension, the lessons learned that could be extended beyond uh, genomics, um, uh, workflow, and then um, the involvement of the patient, which is something that we haven't talked uh, about quite as much, uh, at least uh, this morning, uh, but the idea that um, the uh, patient is the constant actor, uh, and so what is the role? Uh, and we also know that patients are, in many cases are very interested in sort of having a role in maintaining data and helping perhaps even uh, up to and including interpretation in some cases. Um, I think that that 
leads to some really interesting opportunities, and, and it's uh, been my observation that we're beginning to see some synergies between the NIH and PCORI. There have been a couple of uh, RFAs uh, that have been jointly issued from, like, National Institute of Aging and PCORI around patient-centered projects to answer some key questions. And this could be a potential opportunity uh, to think about, uh, you know, patient-centered, patient-engaged uh, comparative effectiveness trials that could be co-sponsored by um, PCORI and, uh, uh, and Genome. Um, uh, obviously, uh, much to be uh, decided there, but it just seemed like a, a potential opportunity uh, in, a, in a very different kind of a, uh, a space. And then uh, a lot of discussion um, yesterday afternoon about the idea about wouldn't it be nice uh, to have uh, this sort of developmental certified EHR environment and toolkit or sandbox. Uh, and then, of course, the questions of, well, uh, we've been talking about this for quite some time, but, you know, how would this actually happen? Um, but uh, it, it clearly was something that I think there was a very strong endorsement about the idea. Uh, so it seemed uh, worthy to bring forward for, uh, at the very least, inclusion uh, and uh, discussion. So uh, questions about uh, uh, the synthesis of key question four. Ken? So I'll just add, I think another thing we were discussing was we should apply and evaluate existing non-genomically focused distance support efforts. And I, I think it's sort of in that last point. but. Um, uh, for example, the various uh, ONC CMS related standards being proposed, this community really should uh, evaluate whether that would work and really point it out if it doesn't. Okay, so so I think we can represent that's probably worthy of its own bullet, uh, and that would be um, uh, I would characterize that as evaluation of existing uh, CDS standards um, uh, to test. Um, uh, their feasibility uh, it, within genomic use cases to basically uh, determine do they work or are there gaps that need to be filled. Alex? Uh, I'd like to mention there was a dual use uh, item uh, to be discussed during the implementation. In other words, the utility of genomic data for research purposes and how the dual use will be implemented. And we discussed. Uh, two levels of quality. One is validated data, which is clinically actionable, versus uh, uh, larger amounts of uh, data that is of uh, lesser quality, but still of a high enough quality to be used for research purposes. Okay. So we'll, we'll also represent that. It um, comes up, I think, later. Okay. So it, it, it is somewhere. <laughs> we just looked at these uh, about <laughs> 30 minutes before we started talking, so I, I'm not, I don't have perfect recollection of all the slides. Dan. So when we were, I was trying to look for the, uh, the announcement of the new BD2K centers, um, but, but they're sort of envisioned as being topically interdigitated with, with a range of um, issues related to data that may, may include things like patient-acquired measures and yeah. devices and, and such that, are, that would be a natural alliance for providing uh, a state-of-the-art platform for doing um, CDS at scale, so to speak, both inside clinical environments, but also at the PCORI end of patient kinds of things. Yeah. They're, they're not announced yet. Okay. The right. first set that's of... Why, that's why I couldn't find them on the website. That's why you can't find them. Uh, <laughs> okay. they, they will be announced uh, very shortly. Okay. Okay. So, Jackie, maybe uh, going back to that early slide where we talked about all the different potential partners that in that NHGRI, NIH funded just uh, specifically add BD2K uh, as an explicit um, part of that parenthetical grouping so we don't forget to an look. Explicit question mark. <laughs> okay. There it is. Go ahead. So the uh, next one we... In the, in the overall synthesis after the discussions, we tried to pull together the rich conversation and, you know, identify kind of the key research areas. And we list them here, and on the next slide, we'll try to tie them back to the uh, uh, fundamental key questions. So the business case has come up several times. It's, it is something relevant to CDS in general, and therefore uh, GCDS, I would suggest, as well, in all the ways that have been described. Uh, get an understanding of the clinical epidemiology of genomic practice and decision-making current state so that we can make assessments of what the delta would be with 
implementation of GCDS, uh, work through these standards issues at the multiple levels that have been described, from the terminology, uh, data structures, knowledge representation, uncertainty management, and uh, the transaction layer. Um, no one actually did address, except a little bit at the very beginning, kind of what would be the um, ideal presentation layer standards, and that's something we might want to add to this list, his presentation layer. You want to add that, Jackie? Um, We've talked about where, what does the CDS, CDS engine fire off of? Um, a lot of you know, I just I realized looking at that that uh, it's not nearly literary enough. And, and Chris said something earlier. I, I think it should for whom does the CDS toll or something <laughs> like that. It should be what we how we should. Rep Th then it doesn't end in a preposition as well. So that you know, sounds any much more like Chris. <laughs> I think so. Yes. So for whom does the CDS engine toll? Um, Working with HL7 and, under, and, and other uh, efforts underway has been discussed. This idea of a demonstration project, but ideally it strikes me that we're going to need to do a couple of things in this demonstration arena. One is think about laboratory design evaluation and assessment from the whole spectrum, and then field uh, assessment as Wyatt and Friedman like to say, you know, so we can get as much understanding as we can in laboratory assessment before we go into the clinical environment and begin to test uh, these tools. At the same time, collect best practices from CDS implementers. People are doing this across the country in different ways in different states. I mean states of, not only states of where you live, but states of implementation. And uh, we talked a little bit about the role of public and the public health, public's health, uh, this generational issue, screening issues, and portability and interoperability. Sorry, Clem. Yeah. Going back to the um, sub-bullet, the best practices, I think we've got a good start there. Uh, in the uh, CSER e uh, eMERGE um, work that Brian is uh, leading in terms of collecting uh, some of these, at least in terms of representation of data in the EHR, and then the work that the eMERGE uh, EHRI group is doing to collect uh, information in the outcomes that Josh and I are leading around uh, how is CDS being done. So we'll at least have some preliminary data uh, to inform that particular piece. It's probably not uh, a bad idea, Jackie, just to, again, put a parenthetical statement and say eMERGE PGX and then eMERGE CSER, um, and so that the, we can distribute those data once they become available. Clem? Well, I, as th that list of things, I think, are all good things to do, but some of them aren't typically supported as research things. Uh, for example, working with HL7, it would be good if it was. But, uh, but I think that's very important. And, and rather than say for synergy, I think it should be within HL7. Otherwise, you're going to do it differently. Yeah. And, and it's what, open to everybody. And the it's, I don't think we should put a bullet down there, say, c c concordant with the national standards that we got already in, in meaningful use, because you do want uh, phenotypic data, lab data, you know, x-ray data, other sort of stuff to help with this whole business. I think that would be an important bullet so we don't forget. So uh, changing a sub-bullet uh, sub uh, two to work within HL7, uh, and then uh, the third sub-bullet would be um, uh, consistent with um, um, existing um, uh, standards through meaningful use, et cetera. Yeah, yeah and I would also say, uh, you know, SNOMED and LOINC and all the other um, yeah. organizations. Yeah, yeah. all extant, um, you know, standards and terminologies. Sandy. Yeah, I would just say I totally agree with the need to work with these groups and, um, and the need for transaction model, data model. I do think that there's a lot of efforts going on surrounding this that can be, that are very synergistic, including the ClinGen um, activity working on the data modeling group. The IOM is working on contributing requirements to these efforts. But I also think that this is an enormously challenging area that requires a lot of work to, to define the fields in depth. And I think that there, there could be a need for some sort of coordinating body across all of these different things. There yeah. are overlapping membership between these groups, but I think that there may need to be some kind of funded effort that provides the resources required to make this really happen in as robust a way as we need it to. Ken? Just to um, <clears throat> uh, follow up on Clem's point about a lot of the things that are needed, for example, shown here, are not typically funded through research. And just noting other, other agencies like ONC, CMS, VA, 
they typically use contracting mechanisms or send have people on staff to monitor involved. So for example, when we talk work within HL7, it means there are people who need to be attending calls every week, getting pushing the genomics agenda and whether it's internal staff within NIH and HRI that can do it or it's contractors, that's not typically research funded, but it's it's really important because if you're not at the table, your agenda does not get pushed. Yeah, I, I think those are, are, are very good points and, you know, again, uh, as uh, Terry has reminded me on any number of occasions in these meetings, you know, the, the intent is not to, you know, come with our hands uh, open to uh, Genome and say, give us more money to do all these exciting things, but it's really to identify where are the key areas and then uh, uh, determine, you know, what would be the best way to do it. And I think, you know, clearly uh, the point that Sandy made about you know, having some type of a clearinghouse for all of this that, you know, we can all point to as we begin our project so that, again, we don't, you know, go out assuming, well, there's nothing out there because I don't know about it and uh, start to build our own thing when there are, are, are items that not only could you um, begin to use to move more quickly but then could also extend uh, to make them more useful overall. I, that would seem to be a, um, a, a very uh, opportune um, uh, action item, uh, although as uh, is pointed out, whether or not that would be, uh, you know, how that would be um, instantiated is a little bit. So, you know, two quick thoughts on this point because the, um, this, this issue came up for <clears throat> CDS consortium which had, you know, people from all across the country, five demonstration sites and uh, two things, one, to leverage the current standards infrastructure, we actually hijacked the CCD and made it into the data exchange package we needed for the inference, you know, in Boston. And that worked okay and it sort of got at some of the, you know, sort of bypassed some of the curly brace type problems by having conformant CCDs being sent in and it was, it worked. Um, the second thing is around the governance though. You know, this coordination of all the activities is exceedingly important, not only for all the reasons being described here, but for then the implementation issues of what does the local clinician say? or feel or have or react to and having that medical, you know, authority from the sites where these tests were being done helped to assuage or assuage some of those uh, kinds of things. Jeff? I think there's a um, social and behavioral science agenda that is not maybe actually captured here and what I'm thinking about is uh, some things we talked about yesterday, uh, trying to understand what the patients uh, views of, of, of the information that they might receive and how they might use it, provider um, behavioral aspects as and how do they want to receive information and then there's also health administrate health system administrators and how they see the value but also how they would use the information. Yes, slide two of the uh, potential projects uh, does I think reflect some of uh, that. Now we did uh, I think limit it uh, perhaps to the um, uh, you know, patient caregiver, um, but uh, you're right, there are other stakeholders um, uh, within the environment that uh, are clearly influenced. Now, I, I, we tend not to think of, you know, administrators or insurance executives as necessarily being, you know, the targets for clinical decision support, um, but clearly there are influences there in terms of what they're willing to support within, you know, the, the environment. And, uh, that, you know, business case return on investment would certainly be a place where that could be uh, uh, that represented. But I think we are in agreement that a lot of what we've been talking about in the uh, issue of, you know, cultural change and transformation came up multiple times in the discussion. So part of the research agenda has to be focused on, um, you know, whether you want to call them social cultural or social technologic or whatever, um, that has to be inherent as part of this. Clem. Regarding, the, we're on key question five, and regarding the first bullet, so newborn screening, NLM uh, in an H um, HITSPE activity developed a standard for delivering newborn screening results using HL7V2 and its, and, um, and LOINC, and it's being adopted by some states, and, and that's the grist for the, some decision support, and it's got every distinct test across all the states available, and you might want to mention it there. And the other thing is, I don't know what the immunization model refers to. You might want to enrich that statement, that line. Right. 
so, so the, the immunization model was what we heard about, um, not in the course of the discussion, but sort of informally in discussions with uh, the ONC folks, where they, they've basically taken the uh, ACIP uh, recommendations uh, committee, the American, uh, the Immunization Practice Committee, basically, that defines the guidelines for immunization. Those have been translated into um, uh, uh, XML and are going to be posted uh, on ARC uh, in a form that could be consumed by any certified electronic health record. So uh, that's going to be the first instance of sort of a public health view of, um, of is, CDS. Okay. And hey, so. Are they decidable? I mean, have they got elements, data elements you can find that you, ch you choose on, or is it just sort of a, a loosely described thing? Um, Ken, do you want to? So I'm actually part of that project. So uh, yes, it's 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 in a decidable form. It's using the healthy decisions format, and in the immunization space, there's also the use of the decision support service approach that uh, a non uh, a HLN Consulting is a company that's built that that's uh, in some commercial systems. Going into the VA, it's open source using these same standards. So there's a lot of immunization seems like a really good topic because it's hard to do, but the and a lot of people want help with it, and there's already a precedence for um, having a third party take care of that kind of stuff. Could you put microphone, please? Put a URL or a reference in there so that people can appreciate how much is going on. Do we have, Ken, do we have something like that that we could point to, or? I can forward information. Okay, that'd be great. So uh, we'll just make sure that Ken uh, distributes that. I mean, again, the reason that I put that on there is because essentially that's a road that's been plowed. Um, that um, you know, we've been invited to say, "Hey, give us your, you know, you're tired, you're hungry, you're poor, pharmacogenomic uh, uh, CDS that you're working on, and we'll try and stand it up and see if it works." And so, one of the things we heard consistently is we need some early wins to that we can actually test. Uh, rather than waiting seven to ten years, and I think uh, particularly uh, among eMERGE PGX sites where we, we could easily select three things where we've got good evidence and we have groups that have built the CDS and implemented it uh, that we could really take through this in a relatively rapid fashion, and that would be, I think, pretty, a pretty great learning opportunity and, 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 and pretty exciting as well. Paul. Thanks. Uh, it occurs to me, similar to what Emerge 3 does with having its own genotyping site and its own RFA for a genotyping site, and all the centers that would get that would deal with that site. When you get to the end-to-end -end test, rather than ha having every CDS site that might participate in this national sort of genomic network, you might carve off and say, let's have an application for the variant knowledge management, a single variant knowledge management, a single CDS uh, knowledge management, and then the sites that actually do the NCDS. And that could build up some standards, and that would mean that the, those knowledge management systems are, are um, motivated to work with all the sites in a standardized fashion. Okay, so that, I'm not sure that uh, maps to any of our existing bullets, so I might just add that, um, you know, as a, as a concept um, that, um, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, funded, I'll just say funded CDS center, and then in parentheses similar to sequencing center, um, although hopefully without all the negative connotations we were talking about last night at dinner um, <laughs> associated with that. But, but just as a co concept to perhaps uh, look forward that you, uh, uh, that you don't have a distributed model, but that you have something that could, you know, could move things forward. I think at Betsy first and then Brian. I, I just wanted to follow up uh, briefly on what Clem was saying about newborn screening. There's the HL7 message. There's uh, definitions that combine SNOMED for the tests and um, uh, excuse me, LOINC for the tests and SNOMED for the conditions, and it's being tested in various states. So it seems like if we are moving that in there now, genetic testing, that would be a very, you know, that seems like that would be a, a path to get that in going. Yeah, and the thing I wanted to add to that is that the uh, American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, as many of you know, had developed newborn screening act sheets that are directed at clinicians to say, what do you do 
uh, if you have a positive screen, what are the next tests? And those are actually built, um, constructed as, uh, as L2 artifacts. Uh, where, you know, uh, the college hasn't had the resources to convert them into uh, actual coded CDS rules, but they're there and uh, would be very amenable to that type of uh, computability. So that would be one more piece that could be built onto that. Yeah, and the ACMG was right in the room when all of this other work was done um, with multiple federal agencies. Uh, yep. So. Yeah, and, and I think that, uh, the, you know, while this is, uh, again, straying perhaps a bit from the NHGRI portfolio, the reality is, is that there's a, a, a very large newborn screening translational research network uh, that is uh, in place to basically study some of these types of issues. And so there may be the opportunity um, uh, for synergy between the NBS, TRN, and um, some of the activities that are taking place um, uh, through genome. Brian. I just wanted to ask for clarification on the central CDS um, center idea, whether this was something specifically about how it relates to the, the issue of interoperability. Is this something that they would be, that they would be forced to, there would be a way for people to um, not have to worry about interoperability with, with outside systems, or would it be a way that some, everyone would be forced to, to cooperate with each other? Since the idea was first proposed about 12 seconds ago, I think that the answers to those uh, questions are probably to be determined. Yeah, I, I, I just, <laughs> I, I heard it proposed and I wanted, I wanted some clarification about what was being proposed. Yeah. So, uh, Paul, do you want to, you want a response since I think you were the one that, uh, that brought it up? Yeah, I, I, I think it is a way of demanding interoperability. It is a way of ensuring that the, it, it, it's going to be vital to have standards between the knowledge management systems that could change monthly uh, and the, the healthcare institutions that are rolling out the CDS. It has to be centralized knowledge management systems and this, this would be a way of ensuring a motivated knowledge management systems, whether it's the CDS or the variant knowledge. And yes, I think without I think both of them are yes to your questions. Yeah. And, and I mean, just a quick thought, Brian, great, great question. And, you know, one of the things that the um, CDS consortium did was to have a common authoring environment. So everyone was actually using a common tool set, more or less, at the end. It wasn't quite perfected, but to create then the artifacts. And again, to Clem's point, this interoperability word <coughs> applies at so many different levels. The goal was to have these artifacts to be importable or interpretable at that level of interoperability and the disparity in our systems. But then the implementation <coughs> within each system could be unique. So, you know, we actually had screenshots of how, you know, one vendor would do it and another vendor would do it. So people could compare, but it was up to them how to do it at the implementation layer. Let me do Jim first. So, um, the, a thought occurred to me, which is sort of a, uh, an inverse utility to doing this. Um, we've had conversations with CMS who's interested in using the genetic testing registry and ClinVar, ClinGen uh, as a way of determining whether they want to reimburse for certain genetic tests. One of the issues with that, of course, is clinical utility. And if you're building um, CDS that works on structured variant data, then it would seem to me we could actually invert that and be able to say, you know, this test in the genetic testing registry tests for these variants which are used by this decision support system to get to this end. And that connection could be done computationally. Um, and CMS could take advantage of that. Um, and there'd be an incentive when people were registering tests in the genetic testing registry to actually provide the variant data for the test. Right now, most of them just say we test for this gene or something like that. Mm -hmm. They can provide the variant data, but there's not a motivation for them uh, to get to that level of specificity. So sort of a library of these rules that's public available that's structured to the variants and structured to the re uh, resources would be, I think, very powerful mm -hmm. for supporting clinical utility. So I think on the previous slide, uh, we do have um, the library mentioned, well, I know we have it mentioned somewhere. Um, but not on, perhaps not on our summary slides. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, do, do but, you think but I think the point that I'm trying to make is, is that 
In a sense, that's a use for a decision support system, which is not decision support in the EHR. Right. There's yeah. another advantage yeah. on and, and, the other and, side. And I it. think that's an important point. I want to capture it. I, I'm just, uh, I want to make sure I, I can kind of uh, uh, put it uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the right slot. We'll, we'll, we'll not take any time searching, but we'll, we'll uh, note that and uh, try and uh, insert that somewhere. Ken. Just a comment on uh, the tooling issue. Uh, I think curious bar alignment is quite useful because um, uh, a lot of these standards we're talking about, there has been funding by groups such as ONC to build tooling for them. Mm -hmm. So for example, there's an open source editor for some of these standards that's been developed out of ASU with Davide Satara and Bob Greenis, for example. Uh, there's open source tooling we've developed um, called OpenCDS that works on these, et cetera. And there's ongoing work, and there's commercial vendors who actually now can output from their commercial tools into these standards. So I think if you align with a lot of the existing standards, it's not like this group needs to come up with the millions of dollars that's already been invested for, for example, building tools. You can just leverage what's been built. Uh, yeah, Jim. Back to the first bullet, uh, were you intentional in picking a back of ear? Um, in one sense, it's the, in many senses, it's the most simple use case for pharmacogenomics. But then you mentioned how it was in the label. Was that the thought process there? Yeah, I mean, uh, to my knowledge, this this is still the only one where FDA says you must test for this before you use the medication. If you set aside the um, uh, the companion diagnostics. Uh, which would be another potential, um, you know, uh, case that could be brought forward would be a companion uh, diagnostic, you know, a BRAF for melanoma, uh, for, uh, you know, or KRAS for lotnib or something of that nature. But that was the reason that, you know, as we think about things to move forward, the challenge that we've all had on our own institutions is, um, you know, the, you know, well, I believe the clopidogrel, I don't. Uh, I believe the warfarin, I don't. And so, you know, sometimes we move forward with implementation, sometimes we don't. But if we can say, hey, look, <laughs> you know, um, this is one that, uh, you know, you have to do it. So it's, it's you, we can obviate the uh, pushback from, you know, uh, some of the content uh, folks on, that in some of the area, other areas may raise objections to saying, well, I don't think you should be putting that one on a national repository. So that, that was the, there was intentionality in terms of choosing that. And that makes sense because I, I do think there's many different ways that this has been implemented. So yeah. there's still a lot that could be learned. Yeah. And I think there's a couple of other, I mean, in some ways the, the ones uh, that are, are purely avoidance of adverse events where there's not uh, an associated efficacy you know, questions associated to it are easier to uh, to mm -hmm. swallow, and so the Tegretol and the uh, uh, 1502 is another one where it's not mandated, but you can think of certain parts of the country where there's a high um, uh, Asian ancestry admixture, um, where that you know type of uh, testing could be extremely um, important to do. Probably not so important for us at Geisinger to implement that one as a high priority. Uh, given our uh, admixture, so. Well, I think this is the, so the, uh, the final Mark, the, slide, the, then. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mark, who? We're, we're looking at the uh, back of your label. Dan, hello? Over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Dan. <laughs> we're looking at the back of your label, and it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't say you absolutely have to. It says you should, and, and, it, and the language for the, for the carbamazepine is actually similar so it's a it, all of which is just to say it's a moving target and i think that yeah. the the regulatory agencies are going to get more interested in this rather than less i would think so yeah and uh, but I, again you know so should um, you know that uh, in the word in the in the language of weasel words may be one of the highest uh, imperative weasel words that we use uh, uh, may as opposed to should. may or can or should <laughs> yeah should so that should the word is should in the in the okay. carbamazepine Really? Yeah, okay. Well, as near as I can tell. All right. It just says. Okay, <laughs> I can I can live with that. <laughs> Mark. No. <laughs> yeah. Good. Okay. So right. th th this is uh, we, we thought um, you know just since we were focused around the key questions that we would try and you know do a mapping exercise. I don't think we really need to spend a lot of time on this. We've had really good discussion to this point.
uh, but this is just sort of our sense of where um, the topics that we talked about, the potential research topics that we talked about in the prior two slides uh, would map to in terms of the, uh, the key questions. And so, um, you know, the first key question is clinical decision support an essential element in the su successful implementation of genomic medicine. We talked about the idea that we have some use cases that we could move forward with relatively quickly, and that could, uh, in fact, inform uh, an answer to that key question. Uh, we spent a lot of time on the data issues, and a lot of the projects relate to some of that. Uh, same with knowledge management uh, and implementation. And then uh, I think what we're going to do for the rest of the time is to go back to those um, uh, two slides that preceded this slide and spend some time on each of those projects uh, to uh, take the temperature of the room about um, your sense of prioritization and to talk a little bit about uh, the logistics of how that uh, might take place. So what I'm going to propose, um, I, we are actually, uh, our break was scheduled from 10.15 to 10.45. Um, what I'm going to propose is that we actually move our break up and that we take our 30-minute break from now until 10.15 and then do um, uh, all of our uh, prioritization uh, when we come back and then basically uh, end uh, either when we think we've discussed everything sufficiently or uh, at our uh, hard stop uh, at 1230. Uh, so there's a certain incentive perhaps uh, to um, uh, be efficient and, and get our work done early that I don't know if it would be unprecedented in uh, one of these to actually get out a little bit early, but uh, we could certainly uh, 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 target that as a possibility. Any, any objections to that? Is that going to be problematic uh, for any of the logistical uh, issues, the webcast folks, anything like that? Okay. Hearing no objections, then we'll um, uh, reconvene at 1015.